I wanted to start with checking in with everyone about your lab. How many of you have started your analysis? A few. All right, how's it going? Fine? Decent? Okay, so I understand that you have another like long lab report due today or tomorrow or something for another class, some of you? It's like, yeah, I'll, I'll leave, like mine was this Yeah, okay, okay, cool. Well, this one should be a lot shorter, yeah. hopefully a lot easier. Um, but just to make sure everyone kind of knows where to start, I wanted to give a quick recap. So when you took data, what you had were, um, so you had a fin, right? With thermocouples along the length of the fin. Okay, and the thermocouples were measuring the temperature of the fin. And we assumed that the fin was at steady state. It was at steady state. It had reached steady state. So the temperature reading is gonna be constant with time. So we took like a few minutes of data maybe, but if you plot that data as a function of time, it's just a flat line. Right, so for your actual analysis, you can just take the average of the time series for each thermocouple and use that as just this one temperature at this X location along the fin. Okay, so when the data came out, it was a text file. And if you open it up in like WordPad or whatever, it's just gonna be this kind of like mess of numbers. So to really understand it, you need to open it up in either Excel or MATLAB. And if you do that, it'll come out as this nice like column matrix of data with your headings at the top that says like time, thermocouple one, two, three, four, and then <coughs> ambient. And so that'll tell you that each column is a measure of the time that a data point was collected, which thermocouple it was collected from, or if it was from the ambient thermocouple. Okay, so if you plot those columns like time versus thermocouple one, it'll be like a flat line, right? So you don't really need the time information. You can just take an average of each of the columns to get an average temperature for the thermocouple. And then you have the geometry information, right? So like the, um, it's included in the appendix, so the X location of each thermocouple. So what I really want you to come up with and to plot in your lab report is temperature is a function of X. <clears throat> so once you have the mean of each thermocouple temperature, you can plot that as a function of the X location of the thermocouple. Okay. <clears throat> and you can do that for every thermocouple or every fin that we have. And then that is basically T is a function of X, right? The temperature distribution along the fin in the X direction, which we have an analytical expression for. We have an equation for that. Okay. So you have the temperature distribution from data, and you also have an expression for it from theory. And the only thing you don't know in the theoretical expression is the convection coefficient h. And you solve for h by basically, however you want to, you can, in MATLAB, you can do find or write some minimization function, or in Excel, you can just guess a bunch of h's and then <coughs> calculate, you know, plug those into the equation and calculate the t temperature distribution from that and compare it to the one from the data. And I want you to minimize the error using the least squares method, which we, I have written out in the lab handout. Okay, so let's see. It's you basically end up with this temperature distribution that you measured. So that's data and that's all known. It's just like an array of numbers. And then you'll have for every H that you guess, you'll have the same temperature distribution from the theory. And then you can just subtract those for every x, take the square root of it, and that's your, your least squares error. So whichever h minimizes this error, that's the h that you should use for that fin. Okay. I think it'll make more sense as you start kind of plotting it up in Excel and and looking at it as like columns of data rather than just kind of thinking about it abstractly. Okay. Yeah. 
So we need the value of h that makes s minimum. Yep. Okay. Yeah, and s is just the least squares error between the measured data that you have and um, what you're getting from this equation, right? This equation right here is, um, sorry, that's q. You want the equation for the temperature distribution. This equation. That's your theta over theta sub b theoretical. And you guess a bunch of h's. And then whichever h minimizes the error between your values from this expression and the data is the h that you should use. OK. If you're still confused on it, come talk to us in office hours or, you know, Send us an email, schedule a time to meet, and we can go over it again. Okay, um, were there any questions from recitation yesterday? Um, Shin said you didn't quite get through all the problems, but they're all posted on Canvas, so if you want extra practice problems, look through them. Um, yeah? Did you post them before recitation? After. So yeah. I can post them before if you'd like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. Um, okay. The one problem that I wanted to mention was you did a resistances in parallel. Um, it's pretty similar to resistances in series. You just have to resolve the parallel resistances. And it is useful to be able to do that because you so frequently have convection and radiation occurring at the same time. Um, so to kind of reinforce that, I want, I'll give you a question with resistances in parallel on the homework. Um, but because we're doing that, I want to just write down real quick so you have kind of a reminder of what resistances in series and parallel are in your notes. So resistances, resistances in series, this is what we've been doing previously. So our total for series is just going to be R sub 1 plus R sub 2 all the way up to the nth resistance. So just the sum of all of the resistances. Okay, in parallel, you have 1 over the total of the resistances in parallel is equal to 1 over <coughs> R1 plus 1 over R2 plus all the way out to 1 over R sub n to the total number of resistors. So then if you want to solve directly for the total resistance in parallel, you just take the inverse of this sum and that gives you the total parallel resistance. Mm -hmm. And then once you've resolved the parallel resistance, you can just add it into the series resistances and treat it as if it's a series resistance at that point. So for example, if we had a combined system where we had a couple of resistances in series, and you learned all this in circuits, right? Yeah. Cool. Oh, it's not a required prereq? So let's say we have this setup where we have a couple in series and then a couple in parallel and then another one in series. To resolve the total resistance for this entire system, the ones in series just get added. And then you add in the total of the ones in parallel. Just kind of write in as if it was in series. <coughs> 
So you basically resolve the total of the resistors in parallel and then stick that into the summation. Okay, wanna make sure we're clear, there's gonna be a parallel resistance problem on the homework. Also, I'm gonna work in one that uses the tables. I want you to just kind of get familiar with using them. Um, so you'll be able to use them on the exam. You should all be familiar with using tables from Thermo. Um, and all of the entire appendix A of the textbook is posted on Canvas. So you can just look up all the table values there. Okay. So last lecture, we finished up talking about fin performance and then we kind of dove into radiation. Just a quick introduction to radiation um, so you know how to deal with it um, kind of as a boundary condition and when you have it occurring at the same time as convection as well. Yes? Um, <laughs> you should know how to <coughs> interpolate. I mean, that's something yeah. you d you've probably done before, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, it is, if you haven't done it in a while, you're like, oh, gotta remember how to do this. Um, you'll have an equation sheet on your exam, so you can write it down if you want. Um, and I assume you all have calculators you can bring. Um, when I was an undergrad, I like wrote a little program in my calculator that interpolated. Um, so you could do that if you wanted. It saved a little bit of time. But yeah, you should know how to do that. Good question though. Okay, so radiation, um, just kind of to summarize, we talked about how objects at a finite temperature emit radiation and they also absorb radiation, um, which is irradiation, um, radiation that's incident on a surface. And kind of the culminating equation on that was this equation that um, gave us the radiation flux as a function of the emissivity, this constant, and then the di difference between the surface and surrounding temperatures. So this should be in your notes from Monday. Um, and then we just kind of talked about how we can write that so that it looks like convection, so then we can um, if the surrounding temperature is equal to the ambient temperature, we can kind of lump the effects of convection and radiation all together in this effective um, convection, or this effective heat transfer coefficient. So the <coughs> only point that I wanted to make sure I emphasized on this um, was that, so we talk about objects are, you know, continually emitting and absorbing radiation, and when we're talking about this radiation flux, and um, the expression for it here. This is the net flux. So it's accounting for radiation that's absorbed and radiation that's emitted. So it's kind of the net gain or loss of heat that an object gets from radiation. So you can just note that that's net. Okay. Any questions on that? So what we did Monday and it'll be important for the upcoming lab next week. <coughs> and if there are no questions, as promised, we're gonna start talking about transient conduction. So for pretty much all of the situations that we've considered previously, um, the heat transfer rate has been constant with time. So we've assumed that there are steady state conditions and no matter what time period you choose to look at, the heat transfer rate into or out of the object is gonna be constant. So for transient conduction, we are assuming that the heat transfer rate Q changes with time so no longer constant, 
And this will often occur when you have kind of a sudden change in the boundary conditions of an object. So say um, for the lab, what you're gonna have uh, actually is you'll have like a sphere of different materials and it's gonna be heated to a constant temperature in a water bath. So it'll be kind of uniformly the same temperature as the water and then you're gonna pull it out of the water and it's gonna start cooling very suddenly. So you basically had a kind of an instantaneous change in the boundary conditions of the object. And so when that occurs, you'll have cooling or heating um, start to occur. And then if basically you're assuming that the boundary conditions are constant after that initial change, then you'll eventually recover to a steady state. But um, between the initial and final periods where you have steady state conditions, you'll have uh, transient heat loss or gain. Okay. So, it often occurs when boundary conditions change. And so we can say, let's say at time less than or equal to zero, we have an object that's at steady state. And then there's a change in the boundary conditions. And then at time greater than zero, it's transient. and then some heat loss or gain occurs transiently. And then we'll say at some kind of unspecified steady state time, we go back to steady state. And what we're really interested in for um, Kind of this chapter is what's going on during the transient period. And we need to determine what, what we typically look for, right? The temperature distribution and the rate of heat transfer. So we're trying to determine the temperature distribution as a function of time during this transient period and the heat transfer rate as a function of time <coughs> during the transient period. Okay, questions so far? So the method that we're gonna consider for um, calculating this is called the lumped capacitance method. And it's one of the kind of simpler methods that you can use to calculate transient conduction. Work three. Yes. <clears throat> so kind of the big assumption that goes into the lump capacitance method and the reason that it's simple is because it assumes that at every point in time, the temperature within <coughs> a solid that is heating or cooling transiently is spatially uniform. So you're basically neglecting any spatial temperature gradients. So we'll say it assumes um, that the temperature distribution within an object is spatially uniform. <coughs> 
So this is basically saying, okay, if we look at what temperature actually varies on varies um, with. So in reality, temperature is going to be a function of the x, y, and z locations within an object in addition to time. This is kind of the most general case. And the lump capacitance method is allowing us to say we're going to neglect any variation in the temperature spatially and just say that it's only a function of time. So this is kind of the opposite of what we were doing previously, right? We were saying temperature is only a function of x, um, like along a fin, through a wall, and it doesn't vary with time. And now we're saying, okay, it's uniform within an object, but it does vary with time. So still just considering one variable, but a different one now. Okay. So for this condition to be strictly true, can you think of what would have to, like what kind of material <coughs> properties it would have to have? Yeah. You'd want a high K so that you can transfer heat. <laughs> exactly. Um, so technically, for this to be perfectly true, you would have to have an infinite K. Yeah. So you need infinite K for the lumped capacitance method. I'm going to call it the LC method. To be strictly true. And that's consistent with, if you think about when we were talking about a fin of, um, you know, higher K, it performs better because you have a um, more uniform temperature distribution along the fin. And we're saying if you have an infinite K, then that would be kind of the best you could get where you have the temperature at the tip is the same as the temperature at the base. So the temperature is spatially uniform in the fin. Okay, same idea with an infinite K. So this obviously isn't true ever, um, but this condition can be approximated under certain conditions. And it can be approximated well enough <coughs> that you can treat the temperatures if it's um, spatially uniform. So this can be approximated if um, basically the, re the conduction resistance within the solid is much smaller than the resistance to heat transfer between the solid and its surroundings. So basically if the thermal resistance of conduction is much smaller than the thermal resistance of convection or convection and radiation, depending on if you're including radiation or not. Basically, heat is transferred much more quickly within the object than it is between the object and its surroundings so that you essentially have a uniform temperature within the object. <coughs> okay, so this um, kind of assumption basically negates some of the previous derivations that we've done. So to find the temperature distribution within an object previously, we came up with the heat diffusion equation, right? And that enabled us to write um, kind of like T of X. Um, but because we're assuming that temperature is not a function of X, we can't use the heat diffusion equation and we need to come up with some other derivation that will allow us to calculate T as a function of time. So we'll say we cannot use the heat diffusion equation So we need to come up with some other differential equation that we can solve to come up with t as a function of time. So to do that, we'll do what we've done several times before and we'll apply the first law to the object. <coughs> 
So we're going to apply the first law to an object. And like we said before, um, that has experienced a change in its boundary conditions. just before time t equals zero. And we're gonna say it's now experiencing transient cooling. This can be applied to heating as well and we'll see at the end. Um, if the object is being heated, you just end up with the sign being opposite and the internal energy of the object is increasing. So for the derivation, we'll just go for the cooling case and then it's the same but with an opposite sign for the heating. And then again, we'll say there's no internal energy generation. Okay, so the first law, the rate of energy in minus the rate of energy out plus the rate of energy generated is going to be equal to <coughs> the rate of change of the energy stored in the object. We're considering cooling only, so we say there's no energy entering the system, and we have restricted um, the system to have no internal energy generation. So we can cross those two out. So we're just left with negative E dot out equals E dot stored. So again, um, we're considering an object. So we're going to say it's a closed system with no work. So heat transfer is occurring, or energy transfer is occurring via heat only. So Q is the energy leaving. <coughs> and then our rate of change of energy storage is the same rho VC delta T, but here it's um, a rate of change with respect to time. So instead of looking at kind of the total change between two specific times, we're looking at how it's changing with time. And then for Q, um, the cooling is going to occur by either convection or combined convection and radiation. And we'll consider a case where it's, um, you know, kind of natural convection with radiation occurring in a large room, so the temperature of the surface is the same as the temperature, um, or the temperature of the surroundings is the same as the ambient air. So we could just, um, this H could be either just convection or convection and radiation, either one. We'll say that H is convection only or <laughs> convection plus radiation. So that's just expressing this Q in terms of our rate equation. And then, as before, we're going to introduce our excess temperature theta. So that's T minus T infinity is theta. And if you remember, we said that dt, um, the derivative of temperature with respect to time, um, is equal to the derivative of theta with respect to time because this T infinity is just a constant. So dt dt equals d theta dt. And then we can just rewrite this equation as negative h a sub s, so surface area, times theta equals rho v c d theta dt. And c here is just the specific heat as before. <coughs> <coughs> 
Okay, we'll do some rearranging. So row VC, and we'll bring this quantity HAS over to the other side. And then D theta over theta equals negative DT. <coughs> So we basically rearranged the variables, swapped dt and theta, so that we can integrate this on both sides. So we've separated our variables cleverly. Yeah. Just to confirm, the c is not a subscript on the v. It's not. Kind of looks like it, doesn't it? But yeah, this is. That's just the specific heat. <coughs> so we've separated our variables. Um, so we have this written now as a differential equation and we want to solve it in order to get the temperature distribution. So we're going to separate the variables and solve it by direct integration. So we're going to integrate from this initial time zero where the transient process begins to some kind of unspecified time in the future. And then on this side, we are integrating in terms of theta, so it's theta sub i to theta. So zero to t and theta sub i to theta. And theta sub i is defined as the initial temperature at time t equals zero minus t infinity. So over here we've got time, over here we've got temperature. So integrating from time zero to time t. At time zero, the temperature is t sub i, the initial temperature. We're expressing that as the excess temperature, t sub i minus t infinity. And then at time t, the temperature is just going to be some temperature t, some theta. OK, we can evaluate the integral. And that gives us rho VC over H A sub S, natural log. Of theta sub I over theta is equal to T. <coughs> So that's our first kind of important equation. And then if we, so, so this one um, basically can be easily used to solve for the time it takes to reach a given temperature T. So this is telling us if you want to solve for T, so the time required to reach a specified temperature T. And then theta is just equal to T minus T infinity. So a specified T or a specified theta. So we can rearrange this if we want to instead solve for what the temperature is going to be after a given amount of time. And we can get theta over theta sub i which is defined as t minus t infinity over t sub i minus t infinity And that's equal to the exponential, so e to all of this um, quantity in the brackets, negative h a sub s over rho v c, and then all that times time. 
And this negative comes from, if you remember properties of exponentials, if you flip these, it's basically like changing the sign on it. So here we've got theta over theta sub i, so the negative pops up on this side. <coughs> so this This one can be used to calculate the temperature reached after a certain time. So temperature reached after a specified time, T. So if you look at this equation, you've got the normalized temperature over here, and then this exponential of a negative, this kind of group of coefficients and properties times t. So if you have a negative, say, x, it's going to decay exponentially to zero as time approaches infinity, right? That's what an exponent, exponential function looks like. And let's say if we increase the value of this kind of group of parameters right here, <coughs> so you have negative 2x, it decays to zero faster, right? So this group of properties that has to do with kind of the convection, the geometry, and the material properties all determine how quickly this um, temperature is going to decay, this temperature difference is going to decay to zero. So if the temperature difference is decaying to zero, then that means that the temperature of the object is just decaying to <coughs> the ambient temperature. So basically how quickly that object is going to lose heat and reach steady state again, become the same temperature as the ambient. Okay. So We're going to talk a little bit about this quantity now. It governs some properties. H A sub S over rho V C. So if that quantity increases, the temperature of the object approaches the ambient temperature and therefore steady state more quickly. <coughs> so we like to talk about things in terms of the inverses in this class. <coughs> so we're going to consider the inverse of this quantity and that's going to be our thermal time constant. And that is tau sub t, the thermal time constant. So tau sub t is equal to the inverse of that quantity above, so 1 over h a sub s times rho v c. And we're writing it like that intentionally because you should recognize this quantity as the convection thermal resistance, right? So that's the convection thermal resistance. And then we define this quantity rho VC as the lumped thermal capacitance. 
Um, so C sub T lumped thermal capacitance of the object. So if either the um, convection resistance or the lumped thermal capacitance increases, this quantity is going to increase, right? Which is the inverse of this quantity that determines how quickly the temperature decays. So if the time constant increases, then it's going to take longer for the temperature to decay to ambient. So this constant, the, or this, um, this value increases and this value decreases because they're inverses. And you have uh, basically a longer time required for the temperature to decay to the ambient temperature and reach steady state again. So this quantity basically governs um, kind of how quickly an object responds to changes in its thermal environment. So we'll say T sub T, tau sub T governs an object's response to changes in its thermal environment And if tau sub t increases, an object responds more slowly. So if we want to um, <clears throat> if we want to use this temperature distribution um, that we've come up with to calculate the total Q, the total heat transfer that's occurred. So previously, Q was a constant in time, right? And the units are watts per second. So if you say, okay, my heat transfer rate is 10 watts, or sorry, joules per second, watts. If my heat transfer rate is 10 joules per second, constant over a period of a minute, and if you wanna know how many joules of heat have been lost from an object, you just multiply the rate times the time, right? But because Q is no longer constant with time, we can't just multiply the time that's gone by. Instead, we have to integrate, right? So kind of the same thing, but if you have something that's constant, it's linear, you integrate, you're just adding up, it's the same as multiplying. But for something that's not constant with time, it's a curve, you need to actually apply integration to kind of sum up the total uh, energy that's been lost from the object over the period of time. So. We'll integrate from time zero to some time t, our heat transfer rate with respect to time. And then our heat transfer rate, um, we just express as h a sub s uh, and theta, where theta is a function of time. So we can pull out h a sub s, those are constants, zero to t, theta dt. We have an expression for theta as a function of time. We derived it. It's right here. This exponential function. <coughs> 
So we can just plug it in to this integral right here, do the integration, and then get an expression for Q. And notice this is capital Q, so it's joules, total amount of heat transfer rather than heat transfer rate. So we have rho V C theta sub I times one minus the exponential of negative T over tau sub T. So we've got this quantity, the lumped capacitance shows up again, theta sub I, so that's just the initial temperature defined in terms of theta, and then the exponential of time divided by our thermal time constant. <clears throat> so if we want to relate this back to the first law, Remember we had negative Q equals E dot stored, the change in the stored energy. In terms of uh, kind of absolute terms rather than a time basis, we can say that is the total energy out is equal to the total change in the stored energy. And so for cooling, because Q is Q out, for cooling, Q is positive. And if Q is positive, delta E stored will decrease. So for cooling, you have energy moving out. We've defined that as positive. So it, the quantity, the magnitude of the heat leaving is positive, you've got a negative sign there, and then that's going to decrease the total energy stored in the object, right? So energy is leaving, you have a decrease in the stored energy. If we uh, were looking at heating, so basically our the magnitude of the temperature between the surface and the infinity uh, and the ambient were flipped, so the ambient temperature was higher than the surface temperature of the object. You, end up, you would end up with Q being negative. And the change in the stored energy is going to increase because those negatives cancel to make a positive. So all these equations and the derivations apply for both cases, and that's kind of the sign convention that you end up with, which is consistent with the first law. Okay, any questions? Um, I will post homework four later today, and then we'll start talking about the validity of the lump capacitance method on Friday.